Okay, so so basically what happens is Tischendorf goes to this this monastery, and in this lecture that uh, Rob just referenced, Wallace gives uh, the history of the of the monastery. This monastery is the oldest occupied monastery in the world today. It dates back to the fifth century, fifth or sixth century, I believe. It's at the traditional. I'm putting quote marks around traditional. View, well, I shouldn't put it around traditional. It's it, it's on the the traditional site of Mount Sinai in Egypt. Now, what, this is a whole other show topic, whether or not it's actually the real Mount Sinai or not. Probably not. Who knows? But it it certainly has been uh, Constantine's mother. Tradition believes it is. Yeah, uh, there, there's a strong tradition, even in Muslim tradition, that maybe it learned it from Christian tradition, that this is Mount Sinai. And Constantine's mother traveled to this mountain and proclaimed it to be the authentic mountain, uh, Mount Sinai, where Moses actually Hence the name Sinaiticus. Yeah. Exactly. Right. <laughs> so Tischendorf goes to this monastery, and he uh, he's befriending these monks, and uh, he's kind of getting to know his way around. And this is, his, you know, in his own uh, in his own storytelling, he says that it, there it was one night towards the end of his his visit, and he uh, he was in a room, and he saw these baskets that they were using to stoke the fire. And uh, he looked in one of the baskets, and lo and behold, he finds what he thinks is a ancient uh, pages from some kind of a manuscript or a codex or something. And these pages obviously are old and biblical. And so he says, what are you using these for? And according to his story, the monk says, well, we're using them to stoke the fire. And he says, please don't do that. Uh, these look like old biblical manuscripts. Please don't throw them in the fire. And uh, he asks then, he found 43 pages in this basket. Now, Dr. Wallace contends, and as do others, contend that this is actually how the monks continue to, to uh, hold their manuscripts are in these baskets. So they, do, they use these baskets not only for uh, fire material, but also just to hold their manuscripts in. Um, and so there was also a huge language barrier between Tischendorf and the monks. And so there is a strong, uh, as we will hear here in a few minutes, there is a strong push against whether or not this is actually, whether or not the monks were actually using this for fire kindling. And all, uh, all evidence points to that they actually were not. And the reason why was because, first of all, the monks would have known that this was a biblical text. They did not burn biblical text. Second of all, uh, the parchment that is used that this that uh, Sinaiticus is on, it does not burn. Neither does the ink. Uh, it doesn't burn well at all. So the chances that they were trying to stoke a fire with something that doesn't burn, uh, unlikely. Uh, even in an old condition, it still doesn't burn. Let's listen to Dr. And they had a, a tradition of preserving. They had a Geniza. Yeah. They, they preserved, they stored away texts. They didn't destroy them. They, threw right. them, they hid them away in, in, a, in a house. In 1977, there was an earthquake up at uh, St. Catharines, and there the Geniza was found where more, uh, with tons and tons, thousands more uh, manuscripts were actually found. And so this proves that the monks, I think in my mind, this proves that the monks were not uh, were not burning manuscripts. Uh, they they had a very high value on manuscripts. They were not burying manuscripts. They were putting them in a uh, Geniza. Uh, and so let's listen to, I think I pulled this clip from, and are we going to, let's see here. This is number Fire Controversy 3. This might stop again. Hang on, we'll find out. In 1960, a Russian scholar. Yeah, I thought so. Okay. Um, before, next, before our next show, I promise I'll change all of my... Uh, all of my source audio over to a different uh, hard drive. In 1960, a Russian scholar, Igor Sevchenko, while visiting St. Catharines, discovered a note pinned by Tischendorf in which he promised to recur return Codex Sinaiticus whenever they asked for it back. If this note is authentic, it raises serious doubts about, about whether the convent really intended to give the Codex as a gift to the Tsar. Just the text of its contents were published by Sevchenko in 1964. But here's a photograph of the note. Okay, I'm going to stop right there because I want to say this. Um, so basically, as the story goes, I should tell the rest of the story first. Tischendorf takes the, he asks if he can take these 43 uh, leaves and take them with him and make a facsimile of them. Copy them off and then bring them back. Okay. 
and the monks say, yeah, I guess so. Uh, and they ask, they ask basically if, uh, he asks if there's more of it. They say no. Okay. Or they're not willing to, to basically show him what, what's going on. So he takes it back to Leipzig and those 43 leaves are still in the Leipzig museum. Uh, and he, he shows them to some other people. They say, this is old. This is, this is amazing. You know, go back and see if you can find more of it. Well, he goes back a second time. He doesn't take the 43 leaves back with him, which was a sore spot for the monks, obviously, because I think that he had promised that he was going to bring them back. He didn't bring them back. He asks and if there's, uh, any more of the manuscript, they say no. Okay. So then he leaves and uh, this was his second journey. Okay. He decides he's going to go back again, okay? And he goes back again, and he doesn't find anything until right before he leaves. Uh, a monk takes him into his room and says, look what I have, and produces the rest of the Codex. Codex Sinaiticus. Okay, he asks if he can take it to his room. He tries not to act too excited. Gets back to his room, realizes, you know, this is this is a great find, possibly one of the oldest Bibles on earth. And what does he do? He asks if he can purchase it from the monastery, to which they say, absolutely not. He asks if he can take it to St. Petersburg to their sister convent and translate it there. They say, absolutely not. So what he does is he leaves. He leaves empty-handed again, and he goes back to uh, the sister convent. And at this time, you have some political things going on with the uh, the, the Russian czar, okay, and uh, he basically says to one of the guys who's trying to get this position as czar, he says, look, if you help me get these this codex here to St. Petersburg, this would go well for you. I will help try to pull some strings for you. And guess what? All of a sudden, the codex gets transferred to this sister abbey where then uh, Tischendorf basically arranges for this guy to get into uh, the uh, into office as the Russian czar. One thing leads to another. Then he gets kicked out. The next guy comes along. Tischendorf gets him into uh, office as uh, as the czar as well. He pulls some strings, and guess what happens? All of a sudden, this codex is then given as a gift by this sister Abby to the czar, who now has been given put in office as a gift. The czar, in return, gives a gift to St. Catherine's in Egypt, and... Uh, the the monks at St. Catherine's have never been too happy about how this whole thing went down. So, all this to say, one of the things that uh, is in, in question here about this whole story is, did Tischendorf actually steal the manuscript from St. Catherine's? And did he make up this story about the fire and them throwing this manuscript into the fire and him saving this manuscript and so on and so forth so that he could get it out of St. Catharines and he could get it into a place where, you know, have you ever seen Indiana Jones? This belongs in a museum, right? And I think uh, what some people are arguing is, is that this is exactly what Tischendorf thought. This belongs in a museum. This this manuscript is unbelievable. It should not be in the middle of the desert in at Mount Sinai at St. Catherine's where no one can enjoy it. Plus plus the importance of the the, uh, the manuscript as a textual witness, as an early text witness. So there's there's the value culturally, which is like museum, and then there's actual content and how that the content of the uh, gospels and you know apostolic writings interacts with other manuscript history, right? So there's a I'm not, lot of value. I'm Yeah, I'm not faulting Tischendorf. If he stole this manuscript from the monks, he probably shouldn't have done that. Right. I However, agree. I'm not faulting, I'm not taking sides here one way or the other, okay? Whether or not the story is true or not, this, if Tischendorf thought that this belonged in a museum and he did some not so uh, up and up things to get it out of St. Catherine's, well, I, I'm not saying that he was right in doing that. However, he Shame on him. Shame, shame on him. Yeah, shame on him. But he but he certainly was right that it belonged in a museum. Right? Okay, let's keep going with this Wallace clip. Written in modern Greek, and the photograph is courtesy of Father Justin. Father Justin is the current uh, librarian at St. Catherine's. And here's the translation. I, the undersigned, Constantine Tischendorf, attest that the Holy Confraternity of Mount Sinai has delivered to me 
as a loan, an ancient manuscript of both testaments, being the property of the aforesaid monastery and containing 346 leaves and a small fragment. These I shall take with me to St. Petersburg in order that I may collate the copy previously made by me with the original at the time of publication of the manuscript. This manuscript I promise to return undamaged and in a good state of preservation to the Holy Confraternity of Sinai at its earliest request. Okay, so now this has been a big, huge uh, point of contention. The monks say, hey, look, we got this, we got this letter from Tischendorf. The question is, is his letter authentic? Okay, so basically what the monks are saying, look, this guy, you know, he went, he, he made our sister monastery give us this codex. He came back, he gave us this letter saying, don't worry, it's in good hands. I'll bring it back to you, I promise. It's not, you know, I'm not stealing it. And so he gives them this letter, signs it, takes the thing, and then all of a sudden they find out it's actually being donated to the Russian czar. Right? Okay. So, then the question is, let me make sure that I got this, uh, is that letter authentic? Mm-hmm.